Welcome to the Asia Chessboard, the podcast that examines geopolitical dynamics in Asia and takes an inside look at the making of grand strategy. I'm Andrew Schwartz at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. This week, Mike is joined by Dr. John Kunkel, Senior Economics Advisor at the United States Study Center in Sydney. Dr. Kunkel has worked as an economist, speechwriter, policy analyst, and previously served as Chief of Staff to Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Welcome back to the Asia Chess Board. I'm Mike Green. My partner for this show, Jude Blanchett, is in the final throes of paternity leave and will be joining us for future episodes soon. Uh, but with me today is Dr. John Kunkel, who is the Senior Advisor for International Economics at the U.S. Study Center in Sydney, where I now sit, and who has worked in government and the private sector and the think tank world on minerals, energy, finance, trade. And we're going to talk about U.S. industrial policy, how it looks to the rest of the world, whether it's working from the perspective of the rest of the world and what it means for the future of economic statecraft, especially in the Indo-Pacific. John, welcome to the show. I know you're a listener, so good to have you on. Thanks, Mike. Well to be here. So we're going to start with the origin story. And I know you're from Queensland, from the sort of sugarcane country. So were you uh, contemplating canes and international trade policy while you were uh, harvesting sugarcane in your youth? Or how did you... How did you get into this business? Well, I think I was an instinctive economist because I worked out comparative advantage pretty early. I knew I was going to be a lousy farmer from probably about the age of six. And thankfully, I was okay at school. So that led me to, uh, I guess, an interest in how the world works, which sort of in turn leads you to politics, economics, and the intersection of all that, and sort of went through that through school, had a sort of quite a weird fascination with American politics and history quite early. So my year 10 citizenship education class, I played, my project was on Watergate and I played Richard Nixon's resignation speech to some rather bemused North Queensland kids. But so I was always probably had my head somewhere towards heading south in general, and that was through study of economics, but then intersecting with politics. And then in the case of the United States, Trade is very much political economy, I think. So that was a natural area for me to focus on for my PhD studies, which was around US-Japan trade policy in the sort of Reagan through Clinton years. And I had some time in Washington at what was the old Institute for National Economics, now the Peterson Institute. And then subsequently jobs around back in politics. So I'm, I'm sort of reverting a little bit to where I was almost 30 years ago in terms of my academic interests, which is great fun. And you've served uh, most recently in Treasury, and you were the Chief of Staff to Prime Minister John Morrison. So you saw a lot of these economic and international economic decisions from a very political lens, I assume. Did it change your thinking about the economics you studied and wrote about at Peterson and ANU? Yeah, I think certainly my through the 90s, when I was doing my PhD in, a, in DC, it was the era of the old Washington consensus. It was not just the unipolar moment, but a degree of, I guess, optimism about globalisation and deep integration in general. And I have to say that world suited Australia and in some ways continues to suit Australia reasonably well. We were a highly successful economy through that time. We opened up our economy. We integrated with Asia. We went 29 years without a recession, including through the global financial crisis. So, there's a fair bit of, I guess, attachment in the Australian psyche to what was the world pretty much up to about 2016. Since then, I think everyone's having to come to terms with a different world of geopolitical contest, a different China. I mean, I worked for John Howard and in that period of China coming into the WTO. Again, there was a our good friend Bob Zelik talked about the re- responsible stakeholder as being the sort of objective that people were looking towards and an idea that China would be a, if not a, a democratic actor, then a rule-abiding actor. And I think for a lot of us, the last few years have been, you know, we've had to grapple with a different set of forces, a more assertive China. Australia obviously had a very difficult period of, around COVID with specific trade barriers and economic coercion. So I guess we're all learning on the job still in some sense in terms of this new global disorder, both the politics of it and the economics of it. The um, Australian debate around economic security and reckoning with this new 
political economy came late, seems to me. When I arrived here a year and a half ago, I was surprised how much people were clinging to the old Cairns Group approach to open WTO and open trade and investment, which probably made sense for an economy that primarily exports natural resources. And it occurred to me that in contrast to Japan or Korea or the US or large parts of Europe, the Australian economy was not experiencing hollowing out, was not experiencing intellectual property rights theft, was not experiencing dumping, which devastated whole industries in northern Italy and in France and in Ohio and Texas and parts of Japan. It seems it was a sort of almost five to 10 year delay before this debate really picked up. And then it seems like the debate was largely about the U.S. Where is the U.S. going? Whereas the rest of the OECD was reacting to where China was going, for the most part. There are lots of debates about where the U.S. is going. Is that, is that fair? Or do you think there were inklings and early warnings and canaries in the coal mine in the policy world before? Look, I think it's fair to some extent. Again, I guess I come back to the historical context. I mean, we had a, a high tariff wall manufacturing sector, but that basically had gone by the 90s. And because of our resource base, we were basically unique among industrialised economies as beneficiaries of the sort of early 21st century China boom, which was a mining boom for us. So to the extent Australians all got a big fat pay rise out of iron ore prices going to, you know, $200 a tonne, whatever it was. That was, I think, part of, whether you can say it was a delayed reaction, part of it's just the structure of our economy. I think the other critical point I'd make is we've been traditionally, we've had a very economistic view of technology. We're just, we'll, we'll take technology from wherever. If it's good technology and it's cheap technology, we're an adopter, an adapter. We've never thought of ourselves in that technology competition world, I think. And that's, I think that's an important vector of where Australia has probably lagged. And I I do think it's an area where we have to really step up and better understand the forces that other countries are are doing. I'd say that we we haven't put a, the sort of capital E, capital S around economic security in part because, again, our historical context has been very much, well, how do we we improve people's living standards through productivity growth. And that's why you get big debates about tax reform and things like that in Australia. So in a sense, and in some ways, I think this is a healthy dimension. In a sense, there's an element of the Australian economic debate which says our success as a country is in our own hands. doesn't mean there aren't threats out there, but we have to get our house in order in terms of our domestic economy. And one of the points I always make around COVID and why we came through that coercive behaviour I argue we didn't really come through it because we had a lot of whiz-bang economic tools. We came through it because we had a flexible economy and people adapted their market behaviour and they found new markets. Now, that doesn't mean that large parts of the Australian business community aren't salivating about getting back to the good old days with China. They are. And I think that's one of the things that the policy community in Canberra is now coming to terms perhaps slowly, but nonetheless coming to terms that our our old model of relying on the WTO, doing a free trade agreements, a bit of cursory consultation with the business community around market access and everything sort of rolls on. I think it's dawning on everybody that that world's now in the rear view mirror. And interestingly, I think it's also dawning on the Australian business community as well. I noted at Davos, for example, comments by Mike Henry, the boss of BHP, which are very much a realist recognition that the world of geopolitical risk and economic fragmentation is now something that we have to grapple with on a real-time basis. Yeah, so the one, I guess, big exception to that technology point you make would be uh, Huawei and 5G, where the Australian government moved in pretty much before the US, Japan, or others, at least in terms of their overt banning of Huawei, in effect, in 5G markets. But in terms of being a technology taker, yes, that sounds right. And what seems to have really galvanized the Australian government and private sector's focus recently is binomics, in particular, the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. That's really started the debate. And I hear some saying, well, Australia ought to do that. And others saying, God, no, we can't have that level of intervention. So it seems that the IRA and Bidenomics and Biden administration's new industrial policy is what has really kicked off the debate in Australia and a serious focus. And you're doing a study on this, I know, and I I know you're not done, but give us a bit of a preview. What's your take so far on Bidenomics, the origins, the objectives, and uh, the economic or political logic of it? 
Sure. So I define really in the project, really the international dimensions of Bidenomics. I don't deal as much with things like competition policy and, and some of the other things that are public investment, which are integral to the, I guess, the domestic element of Bidenomics. So I guess I think of it largely in terms of the attempt to revive the, heart, the manufacturing heartland, putting America at the leading edge of the green energy transition, which is really the IRA. And then I also put the China restrictions regimes around export controls, investment screening as a third third element of, of Bidenomics, because I think that's that's something that will also impinge quite strongly on US allies and partners, not least Australia, as we head forward. But I think the point about, it's been interesting about the reception here. As you know, the Europeans and others came out of the blocks quite strongly, being very concerned about the subsidy regime of the IRA. And, you know, there was some fairly heated rhetoric after that legislation came through towards the end of 2022, I think it was. Australia didn't really engage in that, whether by design or not, but I think in part because because we do have a very important critical mineral sector in Australia, I think it's 40% of unprocessed lithium is, is extracted in Australia, there are real opportunities for us as well. And I think that was recognised very early on by the Australian government. I think there was also a view that you know, there was a degree of affinity, if you like, between the Albanese government, the Biden administration. So we weren't really looking to pick a fight on something. We were wanting, like a lot of people, I think, to understand the elements of the IRA and what were the wrinkles, what were the opportunities. So I think that's really the first 12 months or so was really in that in that context. And then subsequently, President Biden and Prime Minister Albanese announced their a climate compact, which tries to, in a sense, give Australia a seat at the table or a foot in the door for some of these provisions. And we already have it, actually, in terms of the IRA itself, because of the provisions around, for example, the value of critical minerals in batteries, they need to be either extracted or processed in the US or in a US FTA partner country. And Australia is a US FTA partner country, which is rich in critical minerals. So I think in general, that has curbed what some economists would generally see as the scary elements of Bidenomics in terms of market distortion, in terms of Buy American, the protectionist elements which are there and, and are undeniable. And then there's the debate about, well, what do we do in response? And, and that's very much a live debate here in Canberra. I think it's probably no state secret that there, there will be some form of package, a mini IRA response type package in the Australian budget in May and we'll see what that entails. Having said that, we've also been reminded in recent times that these are very volatile markets, and you've seen nickel, for example, crash. So the boom-bust cycles of mining are not going to be over, notwithstanding green transitions. The demand may well be there in the long term, but you know these are wild rides for investors and for corporates. So that creates an interesting, I guess, relationship between government and business in this because how you, if you like, de-risk these investments and who's got skin in the game to de-risk these investments, given that you might be doing them for a whole range of reasons, including national security reasons. I guess this takes us back, Mike, to very much the new world of where the, the boundaries between economics and national security have sort of bled into each other, if not collapsed. And you're needing a really a new framework to deal with some of these issues. And the old sort of rules-based WTO world will only take you so far. So that FTA, by the way, between us and Australia was, was when you were working for John Howard and I was working for George W. Bush. And it turned out it was pretty handy for Australia in ways maybe not originally foreseen, like getting this unique access to the IRA, basically, yeah. Um, yeah. and a seat at the table. We won't talk about sugar. We won't talk about sugar. <laughs> yeah. That's what Michael Fawley told me when he was ambassador and John Howard wanted to talk to the president one more time. He's not going to talk about sugar, but of course he did. And of course the U.S. didn't give. Even among the closest friends, these trade agreements are, as one USGR friend put it to me, they're a bit like root canal surgery without the Novocaine. So when you studied economics at ANU and, and worked at the Peterson Institute, when I studied economics at SICE, one of the things we were warned about industrial policy is it's, it's very, very vulnerable to rent-seeking. And in particular, the IRA and the CHIPS Act 
have been criticized because even if the investment decisions about which industries are right, they're being heavily laden with environment and other social you know, ESG type causes, which are not about productivity and efficiency and return on the taxpayer's investment. On the other hand, you hear numbers that the actual private sector investment around some of these IRA and chips investments is four or five times. It really has sort of... So what's your take so far? It still is early days in some ways, but what's your take on the um, IRA, on this industrial policy as good economic policy? Yeah, it's... So I guess there's the normative element and then there's the what's happening on the ground. I think the normative element, I come back to the speech that Jake Sullivan made in April 2023, which I still think is probably the clearest articulation in the round of certainly the international dimensions of Bidenomics, but also some of the really underpinning logic of challenging, if you like, really fundamental assumptions about American capitalism, that somehow we leave the resource allocation to financial markets and everything will work out fine. I mean, I think the key point that Sullivan makes is in a world where of strategic competition and genuine international threats, you don't have that luxury. You need to lean in. Now, then it becomes, so you, and the old, if you like, I'm, I'm sure you well know the, the line that Michael Boskin gets flayed about, you know, what are you talking about? Computer chips, potato chips, they're all chips. So that world, I think, is gone. And it's interestingly, you do have a bipartisan, a degree of bipartisanship around activist industrial policy. And I think that's reflected actually in the economics profession as a whole. I think you've seen, there are certainly people who have deep concerns, legitimate ones like Larry Summers and others. But there's also, I would say, the centre of gravity of the economics profession over the past decade or so has shifted in favour of a more activist state in strategic areas of the economy, sometimes for national security reasons. And in fact, you know, Adam Smith wouldn't have quibbled for that, for example. Uh, he talked about it in The Wealth of Nations. But equally for a, a range of other productivity and distributional reasons as well. So I think, I think the idea of a, a more activist government is certainly, you know, now has got a head of steam. And, and yes, there'll be issues around rent seeking. I think just as important and some of the criticisms, including from economists on the left, it's sort of this worry about just the capacity of the state to get things done. And you mentioned the environmental regulations. Uh, I don't know, familiar with Ezra Klein at the New York Times, but he has this term, everything bagel liberalism. So you're sort of part of the problem with Bidenomics. It's loading on childcare provisions. It's loading on uh, diversity and equity provisions. So there is a challenge there if keeping a very clear eye on what your objective is and keeping an eye on cost competitiveness. That really is the Larry Summers point and where he, I think, peels off from the, the Biden younger generation of economists. He's, he, he just feels two things, that it's not taking sufficient account of cost competitiveness and it's too weak on trade. And we can talk about trade separately if you like, but I, I think it's fair to say that trade remains the weak link of Bidenomics. You know, I still haven't found a good everything bagel in Sydney. <laughs> it, it probably exists somewhere. Maybe somebody can email and let me know where. But look, Mike, in terms of the on the ground, I think you're right. I mean, I think the jury is still out a little bit. Certainly the investment dollars are impressive. There's work being done by Rhodium Group and MIT that tracks this and it continues to, you know, be off the charts in terms of recent American experience. Now it's a little bit unclear yet how much is announced dollars and how much is ground being broken. So I think we're still away from necessarily being entirely confident that this is going into factories on the ground. Having said that, I think there is also good evidence. And, and as you know, about 80% of this money is flowing into Republican districts. So that is an interesting dimension of where the politics of this may go and what elements may be unpicked by a future Trump administration. There are areas of concern. The last few months, I think sales of electric vehicles in the US have, have disappointed to some extent. So it's a, I think it's fair to say it's still early days and it's a mixed picture. Having said that, the bigger picture, of course, is that the US economy is travelling very well. So that, that in itself, I think, provides a degree of comfort to people that at the very least we're not seeing... We're not seeing the negative impacts of Bidenomics on a competitiveness front yet really having any material effect anywhere. I mean, there are Republican members of Congress who are putting out ads claiming credit for the IRA and the CHIPS Act that they voted against. 
because the target is the swing state blue collar votes. And that's bipartisan. So I, I, I know what you think, John, but I suspect if there is a Trump administration, the only part of the IRA that really is at risk is the EV electric vehicle bit. Donald Trump himself doesn't like it. Yeah, I think that's right. And there it's, I think that's a, like most things in Washington, it's sort of a daily knife fight and who has, who has a capacity to really unwind things. I think there's, there's elements of the, the House Republicans that are, you know, working at the moment to try to throw sand in the wheels wherever they can. But equally, equally, I think the local politics of these things will, will be very important. The 1930s bigger than neighbor cycle that was so dangerous was about tariffs. Here we're talking about subsidies. Do you think that the G7 or the OECD, uh, maybe the WTO, can regulate that so that the race, I guess, to the top <laughs> with subsidies is manageable? And then the other bit to worry about is a bit more historical as well, but the danger of the 1930s, of course, was decoupling. And do you worry about the uh, industrial policy, economic security policy of the Biden administration risking decoupling? I mean, the Commerce Department points out that of the chips being banned for export, we're really only talking 1% roughly of all U.S. semiconductor exports. So it's not massive. It's just the high end. But there are worries that this you know, could look like the 1930s. You, you could fail among the major economies to regulate and moderate and coordinate how much subsidies you could end up, you know, potentially with a decoupling scenario that's really bad for international security, as we saw in the 1930s with Japan. Are we not anywhere near those two worries right now, in your view, or should we be mindful? Look, I think there's always things to be concerned about, and there's always some pretty bad elements of policies that you'd like addressed, unwind, unwound, disciplined in whatever form. I am sort of reminded of a line that I used many, many years ago that U.S. trade policy is a bit like Wagner's opera. It's not as bad as it sounds. And I still think pretty much that holds true. Interestingly, when I was in D.C. in December, the term that kept coming up again and again and again about the implementation, and you mentioned on semiconductors, for example, was threading the needle. So I think, and I actually say that I'm probably not as worried about rent-seeking perhaps as I thought I would be, because I think the administration has been able to have, albeit in perfect technocratic way, been able to take account of legitimate US business concerns, allies' concerns, and sort of thread the needle in a number of areas with the implementation. And I think you've seen that in terms of certainly if you would be hearing much louder noise out of the Europeans perhaps even the Japanese and others, if they weren't doing that. So I think there's a sort of a, a realism that's settled in. The other point I'd make about the IRA is, as we know, and we've had our challenges in this country, you're never going to get an economy-wide carbon price. And the point that people like Brian Deese and, and others who are architects of this, you know, this was always going to be the American response to climate, something that forced the cost curve down on technologies through governments leaning in with significant subsidies. And I think that's right. So I think if, you know, if in a balancing a world and, you know, I think for most progressives, they would put that very high up on their issues of concern. You sort of have to deal with the reality that this is just the American approach to climate change and it's not going to change. And then it's a case of, of really implementing it in a way where, I think there are legitimate concerns about, you know, what Ross Perot called the giant sucking sound of capital largely just flowing to the US. I think Australia's got concerns about that. The Europeans, Japanese and others will have concerns about that. And But part of that is an American economy that remains highly competitive in terms of energy costs. I mean, that's probably one of the single biggest areas that of American advantage in the global economy still. So, yeah, I think we're coping I don't think we're on the verge of a all-out trade war. Perhaps President Trump might challenge that proposition with his, certainly he's back in the world of tariffs. Tariffs, when he thinks trade, he thinks tariffs. So I think that's, in terms of things on the horizon, I think that's the one we still have to keep our eye on. Well, we'll have plenty of time to criticise and worry about that as we get closer to the election. But for now, you said one of the weak points for the Biden Economic security policy is trade. You want to say a bit more about, about that? Yeah, I think it's, again, I guess reflecting on my odyssey starting back in D.C. a long time ago, where 
at that point you still had a solid group, cross-party group, that saw the virtues of trade for whatever reason, economic, geopolitical. Now I think it's just, I mean, this is probably one of Trump's legacies. He's been able to weaponize and demonize trade to such a degree where even people who know that America, an American economy needs to trade, you know, decoupling from the world, if you like, is not sensible in any shape or form, least of all for, you know, lower income Americans who who still have to put food on the table, who still have to buy cars, who still have to, you know, put their families through college. So trade, you know, and that's in a sense, I think, remains a very strong part of the Australian debate here, that there's a very strong bipartisan sense that us putting up trade barriers is pretty dopey economic policy. So I think it's concerning. We obviously saw that in the context of IPEF, there wasn't a lot of stomach to take forward a trade dimension. It's hard to see where that comes back, where that swings back, you know, and it is bound up, I think, also with a particular view of the hollowing out of the middle class. And that, I think that's the area where certainly probably Bidenomics, that's where it grows from. It grows out of that scarring uh, experience. And, you know, there are different views as to what the role of technology, what the role of China, what the role of trade agreements, what the role of other things in terms of the the causal factors. But I think the public narrative in the US remains pretty concerning the degree to which political actors are prepared to use political capital on trade is just almost negligible. I did a debate on BBC about a decade ago with Laurie Wallach, who was and is a very, very vocal critic of globalization and international trade. It was about TPP. And she argued that this was over 10 years ago, that the the right, what became the MAGA base and the left would come together and permanently kill trade agreements forever. And I sort of laughed. She wasn't completely wrong uh, about what happened. She, I think, probably was wrong about what the American public thinks about trade, the public opinion polls show the American public's recognizing the benefits of international trade. Our surveys at the center show Americans would support something like TPP. The problem is saliency. For most Americans who benefit from it, it's not as important as it is to very driven either union workers or anti-globalist city logs or whatever in a few swing states that really matter in presidential politics. The original TPP strategy was, as you know, the next building block in the Bretton Woods vision, if you will. And it was to create a you know, a block of rule abiding countries in the Asia Pacific, link that through the TTIP, the transatlantic partnership with the EU, create, you know, 60% of global GDP on one side of the, of the rule making fight, fight, have a huge distorting impact, frankly, on China's exports and supply chains as countries like Vietnam came in to the tariff arrangements and then energize the debate with China about basically behind the border rules for sovereign wealth fund and, and enterprise disciplines, intellectual property rights. And there were there were clearly people within the Chinese system who saw that that was advantageous to China's own productivity and growth. That was the idea. The big prize ultimately, although no one could really say it, was to discipline China and the global economy. That is no longer an objective that motivates very many actors, even in the private sector. The Xi Jinping's China is not cannot be disciplined. <laughs> uh, he's made his, his path. He's chosen with dual circulation and so forth, uh, the opposite direction. So if you don't have that as the sort of big prize for a trade policy within Asia, what is, if you did have, and you know, if, if Biden gets really elected, second term democratic presidents do sometimes get excited about trade. If you did have a trade agenda beyond the sort of pathetic one we see right now, what would it do? What would it look like? It's not going to go back to the Cairns Group vision of really opening economies. Would it maybe be environmental goods and services, digital trade? Would the purpose be aligning supply chains? What you know, if you were king of trade and DFAT, what would a good trade policy look like? Because it's as much as it breaks my heart, it's not going to go back for some years to what it was. Although I still think the advantages would have been there had we had we been disciplined and gone at it ten years ago the way we should have. Yeah, I think it's always going to be an element of uniformity and pluralism and diversity at the same time. So you sort of need to find a sweet spot. And I think, to be fair, I think IPEF was a genuine attempt to pick up 
things like supply chain resilience, things that, that cross over into the, the, the area of economic security, but which aren't all seen in a purely geopolitical context. So I think, and, you know, we haven't talked much about the Global South and, and Southeast Asia, but clearly their default is still very much we don't want to be forced to choose between China and the US. So I think within that, I do think there's an agenda of building trust where trade, rather than trade being seen as a threat, and this is where I think this is what is concerning about sort of American debate, the trade continues to be a shock absorber. In fact, the Director General of the WTO talks about it in that term. So it's actually, it's a way of helping you get through various shocks. And they can be shocks generated from a whole range of areas, pandemics, climate, or they can be geopolitical related shocks. Obviously, we've seen energy in terms of Russia and Ukraine. So I think Building those networks, I mean, pharmaceuticals, great example. I mean, that we should have coordinated processes on trade and production among trusted partners so these networks are able to respond better to the next shock. Now, that's a broader agenda, I guess, than trade agreements, but it's a, I think there's plenty of work both in a, if you like, there's work on the defensive element of economic security, but then there's a positive agenda of economic security which I think we need to guard against the sort of weaponization of, of economic instruments because I think that, that can take on a life of its own and that can genuinely lead to the fragmentation. And we need to balance that with a positive agenda with like-minded countries. We'll sort of, here we are collectively working to limit the impact of future shocks and where trade actually is part of the solution, not part of the problem. And the principles that animated the consensus around free trade in the US and Australia and in many countries, the, the principles are still true. It's just complicated by the challenges of the energy transition and especially of China. But if in green goods and services, if in pharmaceuticals, you could reduce the barriers to trade, you would increase productivity, you'd reduce prices, and it'd be easier to get things to consumers and to get between countries. And so, I mean, someone has to make that case. You don't hear it right now. But that principle is still very much true, isn't it? That's right. That's right. I mean, you know, we shouldn't be trying to wall ourselves off from others, we shouldn't be trying to produce everything ourselves because we'll be poorer if we try to do it. So you mentioned minerals earlier. I want to end on that because you worked at one point for the Minerals Council. You know, 80% of the processing of Australia's minerals happens by China, right? It's outside of Australia. The demand for rare earths, critical minerals in the two big kind of challenges of our time, military competition with China on the one hand, and then the energy transition, EV batteries and so forth on the other is huge. Do you think, can you envision a trade agenda or an economic security agenda through the Quad or maybe TPP membership that would create the market, the incentives, the private par- public partnerships across multiple governments to actually significantly reduce dependence on China for rare earths and critical minerals, which would obviously be hugely beneficial for Australia. But do you think the, can you envision that? Is that formula something governments and industry could get behind? I think there's a general will to people see that as a direction of travel and an area of opportunity. Technocratically, I think it's really hard and it costs money. And we know all of us, our governments have lots of other demands to spend money. So I think, I think Australia has done a reasonable amount in term, within our own capacity in that regard. But it, it really comes down to, again, rethinking, I think, the partnership between government and industry around risk and the sharing of risk in a world where, you know, we're not just going to let this stuff happen through some impersonal globalisation process. I would say we're probably only about 20% of the way there. And it it does need, I mean, I always thought the Quad was the natural home for something like this because you've got Japanese capital and expertise, you've got, you know, Indian smarts and labour significant labour capacity, again, and with Australia and America both having their particular attributes. One of my concerns about the Quad is it, it's sort of a mile wide and inch deep too early and it, it needed to dive deep into one of these things which have real national security implications and it does require, I think, a pooling of resources and a systematic sort of 10-year roadmap to get there because I think each nation, we're still probably mostly in a world of each nation nibbling at the edges, doing their own thing, 
joining up for the odd meeting along the way, but not really coordinating on in terms of a longer term plan. So I'm not saying it's not possible, but I think we're we're still at the foothills of really trying to do something like that. So your big project is basically interpreting Bidenomics for Australia and for America's other large partners in the Indo-Pacific and Europe. And then on June 19th, you're helping us pull together an economic security conference, which is sponsored uh, in part by the Treasury and Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and ONI in Australia, but with industry input. And that is to help the US, Australia, Japan, EU, Korea, and others interpret each other's economic security policies and sort of get this uh, dialogue going at a higher level across more sectors and more governments, right? That's June 19th in Australia and the 20th in the US, I guess? 1920. So it'll be a day and a half in Sydney. And yeah, look, it's coming together well. I just had another round of meetings with Australian government stakeholders just yesterday, in fact. And I mean, all I'd say is this stuff is coming at a rate of knots. I mean, the Europeans released a new update for their economic security strategy in the last fortnight, going into things like investment screening, data protection, technology. So other countries are evolving their structures and processes on this very quickly. I think the Australian system recognises that. We're probably a, a step back from where we need to be. So uh, one of the objectives of this conference really is to bring this debate in a very real-time sense to Australia. Some of it will involve difficult conversations about trade-offs that people have to make and relationships. But equally, it also provides, I think, the opportunity to, I mean, for example, I know the UK government may potentially come out and do a bilateral dialogue with Australia off the back of this conference as well. So it's really thickening those networks on economic security at a a very important time. Stronger together, and we still have a lot to learn about each other's approaches, and some of us don't even have approaches yet. So very timely. Dr. John Kunkel, thank you. Thanks, Mike. For more on strategy and the Asia program's work, visit the CSIS website at csis.org and click on the Asia program page. And for more on the U.S. Studies Center in Sydney, please visit ussc.edu.au.